Okay, today we're looking at exercise 7 for 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. And our directions remind us to consider how much we need the Holy Spirit's illumination to guide us into the truth and guard us from error. So let's petition his help for this holy task. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to live today for your glory for the good of your kingdom and uh, to represent Christ as we're seeking to know how to uh, craft presentations of your truth that will be uh, understandable and memorable and applicable to people's lives. Would you please help us this morning? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so exercise seven, as you've already read, sharpens your skill in developing the content of your sermon. This is where you integrate all the material you've developed up to this point, and you're going to work specifically on the four persuasive elements, explanation, illustration, argumentation, and application. Just in case I didn't say it in my lecture on James, let me say again that you do not have to do these in a particular order. You can combine elements of these. You can explain and argue simultaneously. You can explain and not argue. Go straight into illustration. If you don't even think <coughs> illustration is necessary for a given point, you can go straight to application. Um, so uh, how you combine and cause these to interact is variable. Now the first thing that it wants you to do is use the um, uh, you use the sermon division statements that you worked up in exercise six, uh, two, three, four, hopefully no more than four, no less than two, uh, to for one exercise seven per division statement. So I have uh, two different versions of my division statements here on the screen. Uh, in, in one iteration of this, I did what do we do to live a, moral, a life of moral purity? Why, do we, why should we live a life of moral purity? And how can we live a life of moral purity? In another iteration, I had kind of more traditional points, the conduct of a morally pure life, the reasons for a morally pure life, and the power for a morally pure life. We're going to start with uh, the first division, so I'm going to work with my traditional division, the conduct of a morally pure life. And I am number three, to circle a word or two that carries the central concept. So in my mind, the central concept of this statement is conduct and morally pure, how you live, and what is it that needs explanation in verses 3 through 6? Well, there's actually quite a bit of stuff that needs explanation in verses 3 to 6. So I listed the term sanctification, the term fornication, the phrase possess your vessel, the term sanctification in verse 5, what honor means, what's concupiscence, what does defraud mean, all of these. And I am, uh, I've written out here a, an explanation in complete sentences of how I would introduce some of this material. So I would say, I invite you to take your Bibles and look with me, please, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. Paul begins by reminding the Thessalonians that it's God's will for them to be holy. Or in some versions it says, this is God's will, your sanctification. The word sanctification means separateness or separation to God. When God saves us, he sets us apart at that very moment. The moment a person saved, they are holy. Yet, like the Thessalonians, people don't naturally understand what the practical implications of being set apart to God are. We may be holy in position, but we are not yet holy in our, 
character. So, Paul writes to the Thessalonians to teach them that being set apart to God involves moral purity. And the first aspect of moral purity that he talks about is abstaining from fornication. Now, in modern English, the word fornication is a term that we use to refer to sexual relations before marriage. But the word Paul uses here is much broader than that. It encompasses any kind of sexual immorality, adultery, premarital, postmarital, homosexuality, prostitution, and so on. So, what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians probably came as something of a shock to them. They were used to the holy women in the temple being prostitutes, and that holiness and sexual activity went hand in hand. And here Paul is saying, no, in fact, being set apart to God, being a temple of the Holy Spirit, means you do not engage in sexual immorality. I remember riding on a bus from New York to Michigan, during my internship in college, I was 21, and I sat down beside a Korean-American girl, and we started a conversation. She heard a song I was listening to that talked about being pure and holy, and she asked me, kind of to my surprise, what's your view of premarital sex? And I said, well, the Bible says that uh, all who engage in sexual immorality will not inherit the kingdom of God. She was shocked. She said, well, the, the priest that I talked to said that it was fine, that it was normal for young people to enjoy sexual relations, and it's no big deal. I said, well, you know, I don't know what priest you've talked to, but... I can speak for the word of God. Here's what God's word says. All adulterers and fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, that's still God's will today. Now, the word abstain sounds like you're just to say no. Just say no to sex or something along that line. But this word actually implies vigorous action definite steps to stay away from and to avoid immorality. It's much like Solomon who says to his son regarding the adulterous woman, keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. There's no chance you're going to be in the house with her alone if you're not near the door of her house. You're guarding yourself from uh, immorality. Okay, I want to pause here. I explained, I illustrated, and I applied, all right there. There was a bit of an implicit argument in my explanation of sanctification. Uh, I didn't make it long or drawn out. Uh, just depending on the context you're in, uh, particularly for people at your age, okay, if you're 22 or younger, you're, you probably don't have the clout, the uh, gravitas uh, necessary to be offering correction to people's long-held theological views from the pulpit. If you'll say what the scripture says, let them wrestle with the scriptures. Okay? Don't invite them to wrestle with you. The difference is saying things like, well, in my opinion, this is not talking about. Well, you just suddenly made your opinion the authority when you said, in my opinion. But if we say, the word of God says that uh, Paul, says, Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to all those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. And shortly thereafter, he speaks to those who are carnal or fleshly and says I cannot speak to you as to spiritual now there is a text that argues that having been sanctified does not mean that you're necessarily spiritual you may still be a 
spiritual babe in Christ have not yet come under the full control of the Holy Spirit uh, due to lack of information in most cases. Questions? Going through, through the word abstain, when it says it is rather a word that implies vigorous action, how do I how do I know that? Would Bible words tell me that? Well, what you would do is you would look up all the occurrences of that word and see how it's used. And you're going to see that it's not sitting in an armchair doing nothing. In its okay. other uses, it involves taking action to avoid. Good question. Any other questions? So are you making a kind of like a obligation in every single point? Because this campus religion is kind of combined with verse 3 to 6. So are you making a... Yes, I'm going to apply verse 3, I'm going to apply verses 4 and 5, I'm going to apply verse 6, and at the end I'm going to wrap up and pull together all of my applications, repeat them, not repeat everything I said, but the main now what's, and because what happens is if I go all the way through with explanation, it's going to be too much information. If I apply all the way through and then don't wrap up at the end, people will forget what I've said. Okay. So I want to have them feel the punch of the truth as it comes along, and then remind them, now, some of you need to do X, some of you need to do Y, some of you need to take Z step at the end. Now is an opportunity to do this. God's talked to your heart. And you're committed to doing what God has s spoken to you about. I want you to signify your commitment to be obedient to him with an upraised hand. By God's grace, I'm going to do what God's talked to me about. Probably most of the, I mean, it, it may be that you feel led to open the altar for somebody to come repent of immorality. But most of the practical application of this passage is going to take place outside the church, not inside the church. Questions? All right. Um, when, when is it not necessary to do argumentation? That, I, I struggle, I really actually kind of struggle with that in James. This passage, there's some things like Entire sanctification, I talked a little bit about that argumentation. But what about, not just James, but when is it not necessary for argumentation in your sermon? So, there's two options here. I want to argue when I believe that my audience holds a wrong idea, and I want to replace that idea with a right idea. Okay. Number one. Number two, as a teacher, I want to argue when I believe my audience believes the right thing but doesn't know why they believe the right thing. And I'm going to supply them reasons for their belief so that they can then argue it with those who don't believe it. So there's a sense in which as I connect every point I make to a specific word, phrase, or verse of Scripture, I'm arguing. I'm arguing the whole way through an expository sermon by basing everything I say on this reason from the text, and this reason from the text, and this from the text. So that's a, that's a more implicit level of argument that takes place in expository preaching. Topical preaching has a tendency just to uh, say, you know, we all know that it's wrong to sin, and you all need to stop sinning. You know, kind of just these broad statements that assumes agreement, makes application, doesn't provide reasons. 
or doesn't justify the reasons. <clears throat> makes a lot more sense. Okay. So, to sum up, three ways to argue. If you think your audience believes wrongly, if you think they believe rightly but don't have good reasons, and implicitly, by tying everything you say to the text, you're arguing for its basis on the authority of God's Word. All right, let me do uh, one more point here under number four, talking about verses four and five. That's probably not all I would say about verse 3, but I only have 15 minutes in this class to preach, so I can't say all the things that there are to say, and you can't either. Okay, so don't try. If you try, you're going to run past us at 60 miles an hour. We won't get most of what you're saying, and it's a waste of a sermon. Anytime you hear a preacher saying, I gotta cram, I gotta go faster to cram more in, uh, what that usually means practically is all the things they're gonna say now are gonna be forgotten by their audience. <laughs> okay. So, uh, four and five. Not only are we to abstain from immorality, but we must also possess our vessels in sanctification and honor. And that's a bit of a strange phrase. What does it mean to possess your vessel? Well, commentators have offered two options. The first is to know how to acquire a wife, and the second is to know how to control your body. Although the interpretations they offer are different, I believe the application is the same. Whether you're trying to acquire a wife or whether you're controlling your body, the bottom line is you are to conduct yourself in a way that is separated to God and brings honor to him. Paul's point is that our conduct with the opposite sex, or with the same sex for that matter, should reflect the fact that we are set apart to God and should reflect the unique excellence of his character. We honor God when we show by our actions that we want to please him more than we want to please ourselves. We want his approval more than we want other people's approval. Now, whichever interpretation is correct, we are to exercise godly restraint over our passions. For Paul goes on to say in verse 5 that we're not to conduct ourselves the way the Gentiles do. How do the Gentiles conduct themselves? Paul says it's in the lust of concupiscence. Pause. If you're using the King James, make sure you can pronounce that word. Okay, concupiscence. Um, also, make sure that you don't mispronounce fornication. I've had multiple students talk about fornification. They get an extra F in there. Um, what is that? Well, that, that's just a, an old English way of talking about doing what feels good. Right? The world croons, how can it be so wrong when it feels so right? That's how the world conducts itself. It tells us that expressing our passions, expressing our passions is just as natural and normal as eating and drinking. And to deny or repress them is psychologically harmful. But God's word says you'll have passions, but don't conduct your life by them. Wow, that sure has implications for transgender, gender identity issues. Because the world says how I feel determines who I am and how I should behave. And God says, no, it doesn't either. All right. Let's move on to number five. Identify the ideas in your explanations that need illustration. Now, I think Joseph is kind of the quintessential biblical illustration of exactly what this looks like. Uh, I think it's helpful to remember that Joseph did not have a Bible. He had no Leviticus 18, no Leviticus 20, right? He didn't have a supportive family. He didn't have church three times a week. 
He didn't have any church, period. No Bible, no church, no support group, no accountability group. What did Joseph have? Well, whatever training Jacob had given him in the 17 years or so that he'd been alive. And God. That's all Joseph had. And he was in a land filled with immorality. Okay? All you got to do is take a look at the carvings on the walls and temples in Egypt. And you can see that they glorified sexuality. And he was in the home of a woman who wanted him. Now, Joseph was a good-looking young man. That's what the text explicitly says. He was good-looking. And she noticed. Have you ever noticed that it's nice to be noticed? It kind of strokes the ego. What did Joseph do? Well, did he hang around where she was at? Did he have, she, he have long private conversations with her? Did he sympathize with her loneliness because Potiphar was gone so much? I know how it feels. I miss my family too. No, not at all. What did he do? He made a point of avoiding being around her. He didn't just make it a point to say no when she asked. He tried not to be available to be asked. And in that way, he illustrates what Scripture says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Some of you intend to say no to pornography. Some of you intend to say no to sex with your girlfriend. But you're hanging around where it's at. You're alone with her in her bedroom or apartment or in a car in the dark. You're not doing what Joseph was doing. Joseph stayed away from the places where temptation was possible. And if you are going to be a man of character, a holy man like Joseph was, you too are going to have to avoid those places. You say, well, sometimes, you know, I work at a, at a body shop and they've got pinups on all the walls. I can't get away from the immorality the guys talk nasty all day long. Okay? So you're going to have to make a decision. Can I be holy and work here? If I can't be holy and work here, then I have to value my relationship with God and my trust in God that he'll take care of me more than I value my job. If I can be holy and work here, then it'll be because I don't look where I know the things are that I shouldn't be looking at. I don't laugh at or participate in, to the best of my ability, the salacious jokes and comments that get made. Instead, I actively talk about loving God, what a great thing it is to serve God, what a great gift God has given in sexual purity. Questions? Uh, I mean, if I have to tell a story, I can tell a story about a... I mean, that, that was the exact story. The guy worked at a body shop, pinups on all the walls, all the guys are salacious talkers. He's like, well, how do I... How do I maintain a pure mind in this environment? Well, maybe that you've got to quit your job. God is perfectly capable of providing for you other work. On the other hand, if God doesn't want you to quit the job, he will demonstrate that by his keeping of you pure in the midst of that, and you're going to have to cooperate with him. I was just talking at the Men of Integrity with a fellow who, uh, who says, you know, Phil, sometimes I really struggle. I'm around rich, powerful men, and they talk exactly like Donald Trump talked about women. And he said, sometimes they say the funniest things. Uh, and I have to, you know, I catch myself smirking or uh, I'm halfway into a chuckle before I think, oh, I shouldn't be laughing at this. 
You know, what, what, I said, do you have any advice? I said, well, remember what 1 Timothy 5 says? The younger women as sisters. Paul says to Timothy, you're to treat women like they're your sisters. So if, if the guy has just told you a salacious joke, pointed out some woman make a comment about her body, how do you think they would respond if you said, uh, that's my sister? Or you asked, would you, would you say that if you knew that was my sister? See, that reframes the whole conversation. I'm sure most men would respond, Oh, I'm not, you know, say anything about your sister. Right? Oh, sorry. Didn't know. Yeah. Well, uh, that's how we're to view all women. Saved women are our sisters in Christ. Unsaved women are potential sisters in Christ. And they're certainly sisters in the sense of members of the same uh, human race, in the broadest possible sense. They aren't objects for our use or consumption. They're people made in the image of God for whom Christ died, about whom Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. So are we going to make salacious comments about Jesus' body? Now, most of my illustrations here do come from a male perspective. And I want to pull up the application grid that I have here for your thinking about. Okay, when, when you think about application, I think it's helpful to have something like this list for you to run through. If somebody is not a Christian and they're listening to this message, is there anything they aren't going to understand that I'm assuming because I think I'm talking to Christians. If, if the text of my message were printed in the local newspaper, is there anything I would wish that I had said differently? Jesus is listening. Am I representing him well? Unity and diversity. God has given, not, not everybody has the same temptations, not everybody has the same gifts, so don't assume that everybody's tempted in the way that you are. Don't preach as though everybody will experience temptation the way you experience it. Gender, marriage, family. I'm going to be preaching to kids. i got to think about age-appropriate language. I'm going to be preaching to unmarried teenagers, college students, young married people, older married people, widows. I've got a wide range of people here that, that this text is addressing because Paul didn't address it to any specific subsection of the Thessalonian people. It's very easy, particularly for you guys at your stage uh, in college, to focus in on kind of a college male related application focus. Uh, it's, it's okay to make that kind of application, but don't limit it to that, because Paul addresses married people just as much as he addresses unmarried people. Uh, now, at first, thinking through this range of applications can be overwhelming. Like, oh my word, how do I hit all these people? No, I can't tell a story for every single category. No, you don't need to tell a story for every single category. But you think to yourself, what are the principles that, are, that apply whether you're married or unmarried? Married or unmarried, the principle is you don't operate according to your lusts, your passions. 
And that's going to be as applicable to the wife who feels unappreciated and unloved by her husband, lonely and bereft, and is tempted to be involved emotionally in an online chat relationship, or get emotionally involved with her boss at work, as it will apply to the teenager who's sitting beside his girlfriend. Questions? What do we do for passages like this one when it's addressing Christians? But I mean, well, I guess how would it apply to unsaved people, or what can they get from it? Okay. The first thing it applies is it tells them that sexual immorality is sin. We have warned you before and told you that they that do such things, uh, God is the avenger of all such who do these things, right? So, just as I say, brothers and sisters, if, we're, if we commit sexual immorality, be not deceived. God takes vengeance on those who... You, know, you say it, who, who take advantage of other people because it comes right after the transgress and defraud, take advantage of your brother. Uh, God is not going to be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And the sinner is sitting there thinking, you know, wow, I've done a lot of reaping. Okay. Now some of you are sitting here thinking, Pastor, I've already blown it. I've already been down this road. My life's a mess. But I want you to know that the gospel offers hope for you. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, some of you were fornicators and adulterers and homosexuals and effeminate, but you were washed. You're sanctified. You're justified. God can write a new page in your life. Old things can pass away. You say, well, I'm sorry to say this, but some of my failings came after I was saved. When we, when we come before God and ask his forgiveness, just like the king who wipes away the $10,000 debt of the servant, God wipes away the record of our sin. Now, it's, it's not true that he removes the reaping. Reaping continues, but... He does remove the record of our sin. He doesn't look at you and think, oh, you're that person who committed immorality. When we repent, he looks at you and says, as far as the record's concerned, it never happened. You can start afresh. From this point on, you can live a morally pure life. Because God wants you to know that holiness involves living, requires living, and is empowered to live a moral and pure life. Well, hey, man. Yeah, that's, that gives hope. It's not all over. I haven't blown it. Messed up. Beyond repair. Yes? Do you think that the Bible is about the pastors that control your own body in some order? The disorder is honor to God or honor to others, which in this case we don't see it. Yeah. So, that's a good question. The text is not explicit. Here's my thinking. Uh, sanctification clearly refers to God. That's set apart to God. Okay. Honor, I'm going to assume, relates to God unless the text changes my perspective. I don't see anything in the text that talks about honoring other people, honoring parents, honoring believers. Okay, And the fact that he comes back around and says it's God who takes vengeance on those who disobey, again, seems to make this a God-focused text. So those are my reasons for going with honor toward God. Okay. Now, if I honor God, will I also honor other people? Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, but they aren't the focus. Just like 
Just like Jacob says, you know, how can I, if Potiphar put everything in my hands, you know, the only thing he's withheld from me is you. Okay, that's Joseph showing his concern for honoring Potiphar. But at the end of the day, Joseph says, how can I sin and do this great evil against God? So it's not an either or. Right. Now, I, I noticed something, and I put it in explanation, but I, I don't know if it was a bit of a stretch. But I, I noticed that um, the, it almost seems like he's addressing three areas of sexual immorality. He says, control your own body, dealing with self, um, in sanctification and honor, going to God, and then not transgress or wrong his brother, dealing with others. Um, and I said that sexual immorality strikes at the heart of all three of these areas in someone's life. Our own, our own self, our standing with God, and our um, relationships with others. That's good. That's true. Okay. I didn't know if that was a bit of a stretch. No. First Corinthians, I mean, if you want a passage to support it, First Corinthians six eighteen, he that commits immorality sins against his own body. Okay. All right. We've talked about argumentation, and I've listed possibilities. I argued in this last point that possess your vessel means control your body. And I also argued it didn't matter which interpretation you take, that the application was the same. Okay. Um, I, I would, in my sermon, I would also argue that the command not to defraud your brother implicitly calls us to guard our brother. This is not just a mind your own business call, but it's also a call to be on the lookout for the other. So, number seven, application. I'm, I've made several applications. But I want to focus, I want to remind you about what, so what, and now what. What is What does the text say? So what is, how does that apply to me? How is that relevant to me? And now what? Ask, what do I do right now? Okay, I heard you. What's the first thing I'm supposed to do now in response to this truth? What's the second thing? Now, you don't have to cover all the possible now what's. But what you want to do is think about your audience and say, what are the most salient, the most relevant to the most people here, specific steps that need to be taken? So, some of you need to recalibrate your relationships with the opposite sex. For some, it will be at work. For others, it will be in your dating relationships. Others, it may be your neighbor. But you need to bring your relationships under the authority of this Word of God. You say, well, what might that involve? Well, that might involve cutting off a relationship that you know is not godly, not honoring to God. It may mean going to somebody that you've wronged and say, I was wrong. I acted according to my passionate lusts. I shouldn't have done what I did with you. Please forgive me. And if you had done wrong, it certainly involves going to God and asking for God's forgiveness. Others of you, you're, you have not yet reached this stage, but you're heading there. Some of you need to sit down and write down the principles that are going to keep you from sexual immorality. That are going to keep you from operating according to your passionate lusts. That are going to help you guard your brother or sister's purity. And so honor God. Are those concrete 
actionable steps? I think so. Some of you say, well, Brother Brown, I'm aware of all this, but I haven't been relying on the Holy Spirit to empower me. I haven't been asking God to strengthen me before I went on my date or before I went to work or before I interacted with my colleagues. And it's thank you for reminding me that the Holy Spirit dwells within me and I need to commit to every day saying, Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, guard me. Holy Spirit, empower me to do what's right. I'm committed to being promptly obedient to your checks. How many would, by a show of hands, say, yes, by God's grace, I intend to do that? So, I've got them responding now, and I've given them a now what for Monday. That's the way I like to phrase it. What do I want these people to do tomorrow in response to this message? Most preachers tend to think, what do I want them to do right now? Come to the altar, raise a hand, make a commitment. That's good. I want them to do something now in response. But I don't want it just to be now. I want it to be tomorrow and the next day. And so on. Some of you, it's just as simple as you don't go down the magazine aisle in the grocery store. You install ad blocker on your computer so that when you're on the internet, you're not seeing, and you're on Fox News, you're not seeing all the salacious, immoral advertisements or news stories that Fox News puts on their website. Some of you just need to not go to Fox. Here's, here I'm going to quote Jesus who says, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Jesus says, radical action is necessary to remove sin from a believer's life. Well, I, I hope that I've given you a sense of how both to do this exercise and how this flows out then in the preaching. You are going to have more to say than you can say in 15 minutes. I give you 15 minutes is the max. 12 minutes is the minimum. You've got a three-minute window as the target. Land inside the window, and you're good. Outside, and you start losing points. At 17 minutes, I'll flag you down and say, okay, stop. That's a very uncomfortable way to end the sermon. Okay. But I can't afford to have you going over time. So please don't make me flag you down. <laughs> All right. Um, I believe that's all for today. <laughs>